I think a huge part of it is social media. Because before we were only exposed to the couples that we could see and that, you know, were actually in front of us or maybe we're on TV in movies on a red carpet. But now you open Instagram, you open TikTok and it makes it seem like everyone is in a relationship. Right. Even if that is literally not the case, because it's not. First of all, half these people posting like kissing pictures and stuff are not happy. Mm. Maybe all of your friends are actually also single, but the few, the, the people that you follow on social media from college who were like not even in your close friend group, but just were your acquaintances, they're all in relationships. So it makes you feel like, oh, everyone else is except for me. Damn, let's talk some shit. It's Polly Siegel and Victoria Aaron, two licensed therapists who've spent way too much money on degrees, certifications and trainings. Mm. We both love what we do and couldn't imagine working in any other profession, but we're forced to be serious all the time and that gets boring. Shit Talking Shrinks discusses important mental health topics, the human experience and society at large while poking fun along the way. It won't be all fun and games because after every episode, you'll walk away with tangible tools to navigate life more effectively. We love a tangible tool. Hello, everyone. Hey, hey, hey. We we have such an awesome guest today that Victoria and I are really, really pumped about and feel really honored that you took time out of your day to hang with us two crazos. Um, but we have Alana Dunn, who is the host of um, Seeing Other People. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. It talks all about dating and the journey of it and modern shenanigans that happens in that world. And it's awesome. Shalom. Shalom. Chag Sameach. <laughs> Chag Sameach, everyone. I put the extra ch. Yeah, I can't do that. I just don't have that in me. Yeah. So give a little introduction to yourself. Who the heck are you? Who are you? I'm still trying to figure that out. Yeah. Good. You know, it all started on a Tuesday in 1994 (laughs) (laughs) when when I I I was born uh, room 724 in Valhalla Hospital. I don't know. Um, Is that true? Wait, that's incredible that you know what room you were born in. I don't. I do. It was a Tuesday. It was 1243 a.m. But I don't. It was at. I know what town is it was in, but I don't know the hospital room. <laughs> but I'm so sentimental and nostalgic that when I give birth, that hospital room is going to be like on a frame somewhere like that is going to be remembered. <laughs> I love that. All the crazy people that listen to our podcast now could do your birth chart, Alana. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> Anywho. Watch out. But yeah, I'm scared. I yeah, so I host Seeing Other People, which is really about the ups and downs of modern dating and really just how hard it actually is because I had the most difficult time finding love. And there were so many experiences that I had that made me feel like I was crazy, made me question what's wrong with me or am I not deserving of love? Like, why can everyone else seem to get into a happy relationship and not me? And it was really challenging. And and at this time, there weren't a lot of people being super candid and, and open and vulnerable about their dating struggles. And so I decided to be that person. And yeah, I worked at Hinge for a little over two years running their social media. And that's where I started my first podcast called Dating Sucks. And that kind of was just this light bulb moment of like, this is what I'm meant to do. And fast forward, here we are doing it. Okay, tell us a little bit about working at Hinge. That's that's pretty dope. Yeah. Listen, ups and downs like any job. I'll be honest, though, for the most part, it was such a wonderful experience where you know, when I started there, I was like the 34th employee. It was super tiny, super startup mode. And when I ended, there were probably like uh, like over 100 people. But it was just a really wonderful community of people who just genuinely wanted to help other people find love, which was so, so awesome. And yeah, I was on the marketing team there. And um, I got to be really creative for a while and got to, you know, experiment and just talk to so many 
daters who were using the app and hear from them about what they were struggling with. And my job was to kind of create content that would help them with that. And it was such a great opportunity for me and definitely led me to finding what I was passionate about and led me to doing what I'm doing now. And you just recently got engaged. Mazal tov. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ta-da. Um, that, those are all the Hebrew words I know, by the way. Shalom and ta So we're done there. But you could add a Rabbah to the end of that. It's very much. Oh, Toda Rabbah. You know, I did take Hebrew 101. <laughs> Listen, you're good to go. Toda Rabbah. Got it. Learn something new every day. Hey, I should know what that means. Oh, my God. This one's embarrassing. <laughs> You're a bad Jew. You're a very bad Jew. A lot of dud. Listen, I, I did the four questions two nights in a row. So my, my work here is done. But <laughs> <laughs> what were we talking about? No, I just want to. I mean, you started a podcast about how hard it is to find love and the shenanigans that happen in the journey. And then you just recently got engaged. So that's what we were talking about. Apparently, my advice works is the moral of the story here. So people could consider listening to it. Yeah. I And for a very long time, I didn't. But here's the thing is what I try and put out there is really what I learned through so much trial and error and making so many mistakes. And, and my whole point is like, I made these mistakes so you guys don't have to. And once I got through making those mistakes and, and decided to learn from them and, you know, maybe break some bad habits, that's when I met my now fiance, Jake. And so there was such a clear difference in my dating behaviors and the behaviors I accepted from others. Once I turned this point where I was, you know, moving more towards like finding a healthy relationship and healthy dating behaviors. And so I really try and put all of that out there. And, that, and that's try, what I try and preach. And I get really frustrated because there's a lot of really toxic dating advice out there. And oh, give us some. Give us some. Come on. Oh, my God. Well, OK, I there's one whole thing about like you can't if you're a girl like I mean, the whole concept of a girl can never text first. A girl can never ask a guy out. Um, a girl shouldn't send a thank you text after the date. Like, come on. Meanwhile, every guy I talk to is like, if a girl doesn't send a thank you text, that's a huge red flag for me. Mm. No. So I was in the dating game for 12 years and in Denver. Um, and I always sent a thank you note. Like if I liked the person and I wanted to show I'm interested and I'd like to see you again, of course, I provided verbal affirmation to allow the other person to know where I'm at. And if I didn't send a thank you, that was also a sign of like, you know, I, I don't want to see you again. It makes no sense to me why anyone wouldn't send that thank you text. But there are people out there who believe that, you know, a it shows like you're desperate, you don't want to wait for the, per the man to say to like, think if they decide they want to see you again, and then reach out like, or you could be interrupting their thought process of do they want to see you again? And you already think them in person. So to follow up is just like this extra thing that you don't have to do. And it, it really frustrates me. There's also this is fucking insane. That's fucking insane. And there are so many women out there who are like, OK, well, this one person said this or these two people that I follow said this. So now I can't send a thank you text ever again. And it's like, mm, stop. No. So that's what I'm here to kind of try and break through. And so keep going. So no thank you text. That's trash. No initiating text. No initiating text. What are other things? Because let's try to debunk this for anyone who's listening to this bullshit. A big one that I've seen a lot of big influencers and, and some celebrities even talking about lately is like, if you and your partner don't have sex at least three to four times a week, like then there's something wrong in your relationship. Like you're not in love. Like you should be all over them, especially in the first year. Otherwise it's a huge red flag. And like that frustrates me so much because I'd say like nine out of 10 of the women that I talk to have very low sex drives. Some people don't want to fuck. Yeah. Or you're tired or you're stressed. And so these like blanket statements of if you're not doing this, then something's wrong in your relationship. That makes people second guess what could be an incredibly healthy relationship where them and their partner are on the same page. And so it's so frustrating to me as someone who just wants people to recognize like there are so many different types of relationships. 
you're also going to go in phases. Like sometimes you might want to do it three to four times a week. Sometimes it might be three to four times a month. Like it's all different depending on so many circumstances that are happening. And so I just get very frustrated by these just blanket statements that make people feel like they're doing something wrong when they're not. Yeah. You know, another one, as I'm thinking about this, because I think it's it's so important that we're talking about the bad advice that that all of us, I guess, feel forced to subscribe to is the idea that like if you're in a rough patch and your gut feeling is telling you that things aren't right and that you're not aligned, then that means you should just dip. Mm. And it's like, no, relationships, we, Victoria and I did a phenomenal episode on rupture and repair. And sometimes those rough patches are because there are ruptures that haven't been repaired. That doesn't mean you dip and you just walk away. It means that you lean in and you create repair and connection and reestablish the homeostasis. So I feel like this whole, this whole like phenomena of like, if you don't like it, just fuck that. It's like, that's that's not realistic. Like we have to move through conflict and get to the other side of it. And that's what ends up making your relationship stronger. Right. Right. Now, sometimes it might be that you should exit the re- relationship because that's what's needed. But this very quick, like if you're uncomfortable, peace out, I think is really detrimental. I think it's so sad that like all of this, like everything you're talking about, all this bad advice that gets put out there, all this like second guess your intuition, all this bullshit about like what you should do and what you shouldn't do. It's all based on fear. Either you're going to lose something that you have or you're not going to get what you want. And then you're just like left. Like I just imagine like because like I'm a Jewish girl from the north suburbs of Chicago, right? Like I should be married. I should have a kid. You know, I should have like I should have an MRS you know, and like I shouldn't be working and I should have a nanny, you know, and it's like, and you should eat gefilte fish. Yeah, I should. I should. And it's like, it's crazy because it's, it's just instilling so much fear in people. And like, how do you, how can you date when you're in fear like that? Like you can't even enjoy yourself. You can't. And that's one of the saddest things is that dating should be fun, but we feel so much pressure to do what's expected of us. Like to your point where I remember like sitting in my therapist's office when I was probably like 25 and saying like why I needed to meet. I was trying to explain why I needed to like meet somebody like tomorrow and why I was putting such an emphasis on dating and finding my person. And I'm like, well, if I want to, you know, have kids by the time I'm in my like early mid thirties. And that means I need to get married by the time I'm in my like late twenties, which means, you know, I'd be dating somebody for a few years, like living with them for at least a year before we get engaged, get it being engaged for like a year and a half before we get married. So that means that my window to meet somebody is like in the next three to six months. Otherwise I'm screwed. Yeah, literally. And there are so many people that feel that way. Right. My point is that is the wrong mindset to have and dating should be this really fun, explorative time where you get to meet people and learn about different people's experiences and learn more about yourself and learn what excites you and what types of people you connect with and what you're not interested in. And while doing that, think about all of the cool bars and restaurants and activities you get to go try that you otherwise wouldn't have gotten to try and all the things you get to do. And it should be this really fun wonderful, awesome experience being single and dating. But instead, our society and culture puts a target on people's backs. And it's like, oh, you're single. Well, you have work to do because you don't have your person yet. And that's how it makes us feel. And that that means that there's some sort of flaw or deficit within us that it shouldn't be this hard when in fact the algorithm and the process is incredibly difficult and grueling and painful and so many people are suffering in this dating world. I, I was suffering for, for 12 years in the process. That's so fucking crazy. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, one of the things that I think Victoria and I want to hear from you is like, how do you encourage people to work through the anxiety that comes up in modern dating when they're on a million apps and they're talking to too many people and they're juggling so many hats? And what does that look like? I think there are a few things you can do. The first I would say is really try and limit your time spent on the apps. I actually encourage people to 
only have the free version of Hinge instead of the paid version because the paid version gives you unlimited likes. The free version, after like 10 likes, you're done for the day. So that means you don't have to spend the next three hours swiping through hundreds of people that then if you don't get matches from the hundreds of people you're swiping through, you're going to end up feeling more down about yourself because you're not getting that instant validation just from you know swiping right and having a match. And with that, also, you're being way less intentional. If you're swiping through like 100 people and just sending likes to like anyone you think is semi attractive, as opposed to actually taking the time and caring about the few likes that you have for that day, looking through profiles and saying, okay, who would I actually maybe get along with? Like, oh, this person's prompt about, you know, spending time with their family, like I'm really family oriented, like maybe me and this person have some shared values. So, okay, wait, time out. Yeah, Vic, you look like you're about to jump out of your seat. I am like literally crying. I need to. So Pauline and I went to a celebratory dinner for our first anniversary of our of shit talking shrinks, right? Like we finished season one. We were so stoked. We went out to dinner and I lost a bet. And we discussed because I lost a bet, I have to express something really embarrassing on the podcast. It just hit. So when I got out of my seven and a half year relationship 10 months ago, are you ready for this? I dropped $1,400 on the league. No. What does that even get you? I. <laughs> what? You guys, you guys. What do you mean? I, $1, you crazy bitch. I swear to fucking God, I get the league because I was like, I want to date like. I, I have money. I want to date people with money. <laughs> and so I Googled what like the best, the best apps were and the league came up and it was like, oh, there's a waiting list, but like you could drop $1,400. So I fucking did it. You just got fucking bamboozled <laughs> by the league. They were probably sitting there being like, wow, this person's really in a rough patch, really going through it. I was desperate do you understand like i was so think about it i was in a seven and a half year relationship my whole 20s was gone so i was like sitting there like i can't be alone you know and like the league it was my it, it promised me everything i could ever imagine it was my genie in a bottle <laughs> did, it, did it fulfill that promise it was terrible honestly it was the worst sight of all of them it was the so I only got like three options a day, like a day. Yeah. Oh my God. I don't even want to look at how much money I've spent on dating apps. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't take the free version. I had to spend money on it. I love that. That, that is really fucking embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty brutal. Like $1,400. That's not chump change, my friend. That's not chump change. <laughs> I just can't believe they like set. Here's my question. Like, did they set that price being like, OK, we have to put an option, but like we don't want anyone to actually do it because we're going to take them off the wait list in like 72 hours anyway, if they're like qualified to be on this app. So we're just going to put it at that. Or are they like, wow, like we're just going to like cash in on these people who like have had a few too many drinks and just are feeling a few too, a few like. I was 100% sober, Alana. I haven't used drugs oh or alcohol in, in almost 11 years. OK, I was fucking <laughs> fucking mortified by desperation. You've never seen anything in your life like this. So, yeah, my heart goes out to you. It's OK. My boyfriend's in the other room. My boyfriend's in the other room. He probably hears this. And that's. Th yep. Perfect. So I met him at a at a young people AA conference, a little less desperate than dropping fourteen hundred on a fucking dating app. <laughs> there we go. Are you happy, Polly? Was that a good one? I couldn't. My heart is bursting with joy. I want to take a quick pause to talk about our sponsor, a company called BetterHelp. It's an online therapy platform where all the therapists are licensed and accredited professionals. It's affordable. You pay a low flat fee for therapy with your therapist, and it's convenient. Do it at your own time and at your own pace, and you can communicate with your therapist as much as you want and whenever you feel is needed. And more importantly, it's effective. Thousands of people have benefited from therapy using BetterHelp, and we're really grateful to offer all of our listeners 10% off your first month. So if you're interested in receiving therapy ASAP, click the link in our show notes and you can get started and you get to save money. Back to you, Alana. Back to you in the studio. Back to you, Alana. 
Back to me. Okay. Another, a big thing um, with dating anxiety, I think is the way we approach first dates. And this is something that I really struggled with. So a lot of people get really anxious about going on dates. And so what I encourage those people to do is really shift your mindset about the purpose of a first date. You know, some people go in, it's like, this, it, this is make or break. I have to impress them. I have to live up to their expectations. Like I've already, you know, tried on their last name with my first name for size. And they like the way it sounds. And I'm picturing our wedding. Like people literally build up such h- these stories in their head about these people and put them on such a pedestal. Psycho that there's so much pressure going into the first date when really all a first date should be is like, do we have a good time together? And like, what did the conversation flow? Do I want to see this person again? That is literally the only thing that you need to get out of a first date is do you want to see them again? And so I think, you know, reframing that mindset and shifting it from like, okay, this first date like is all or nothing. And I have to, If it doesn't, if I don't get to a second date, then it was a failure and I'm a failure. Instead, I want to have fun on this first date and I want to learn something. And that learning something could literally be like, there's a restaurant you've wanted to try and you learned that you love it. Or you tried a new food or you learned about something that this person does for work or something about the place they grew up. Or you learned that, oh, when I actually open up about this thing, it felt really good. And maybe I could talk about that more. Or, you know, I talked about this thing and and I don't really think I'm comfortable with doing that on dates again. I'm going to pull back and not talk about that thing on dates. So it's literally just about having fun and learning something because every single date you go on is a building block for the next one and the next one. And eventually you're going to have learned so much stuff that you're going to be in a really great place to actually meet the person or show up on a date with that person that you're going to end up being with and, and be your best self. Right. The other thing I would add, because everything you said is spot on, is walking into a first date and trying to seek and notice the gratitude you feel in the process. Like, do you have gratitude because he made or she made you laugh or they made you laugh? I'm trying to be inclusive. Um, Do you feel gratitude for the food you ate? Don't don't shake your head at me. <laughs> I'm I'm on to something here. Okay? You're with like, it. I'm with you. I'm with you. No, like, do I feel gratitude because I ate a delicious meal? Did I get to see a beautiful thing that, you know, the city skyline or I got to. There's so much to get out of it. Yeah, there are so many positives. You get what I'm getting at. Right. There's there's gratitude to be had, you fucking assholes. <laughs> Wait, can I? <laughs> Alana, Alana was just trucking off of me being like. <laughs> She, she's like, she was, she's guilty by association right now. But can I, can I say something? Cause when you were talking about like, does, does my first name match with their last name? I'm going to, am I going to hyphen? What's our baby's going to look like? Are our parents going to get along? And Paulina was like fucking psycho. I have, I have a question. So I did that. Did you spend $1,400 getting an AI generated photo of babies before you went on a date with someone before AI existed? I'll tell you. That if I actually looked at the amount of money I've dropped in the last 10 months via dating, you guys would be astounded. It's disgusting. What is it? Make yourself look worse. Say it. I don't want to. I want to say this. I want to say this. This is what I want to say. So when I think about the guys that I encountered, right? So Alana was like, she was, you know, you don't have to think about this. You don't have to think about that. But like, I also encountered guys who like I was matching their energy because they were bringing that to the table. Like I, I brought this up in in our podcast about modern dating, right? Like I was like his, his in the first week, he was like, I can't wait to take you to my parents' house in Naples. And I was like, oh my God, this guy wants to take me to his parents' house. Like that's my fucking dream. Like I, I want, you know what I mean? It's like, so I'm just mad. Like I was just matching their energy a lot of times. And then, you know, they would pull back and do the fuck boy thing. And I'd be like, what's wrong with me? <laughs> Like, you know, but I'm happy you're saying this because in, in, you know, the clinical work that I do, I hear that like he was leaning in, he was wholehearted, he created so much safety. And then I leaned in to match that. And then he fucked me over. Exactly that. Yeah. What's that about? Well, it, that's, that's avoidant attachment at its finest. Right. But it's like, it's a, it's a, like an epidemic with dating apps. I think, you know, there's this whole, idea going around about like romanticizing your life and romanticizing every aspect of it. And I think people just get so 
excited. They want to fill this void or maybe they just got out of a relationship and they're looking to find somebody to talk to and, and to replace that other person. And so they're just going all in on on the way they would behave and act with their past significant other. And that's really I mean, that's just one example of what it could be, but that's totally not the way to approach dating. I mean, we also hear a lot about that with love bombing. And I think there are so many people who have, you know, quote unquote, fallen victim to that. But at the same time, not all of these people are setting out to love bomb someone intentionally or not. It's just, you know, it, I feel like we all feel this pressure to like win people over mm. and be liked by someone. And so whether or not we even like them, we just want them to like us. And so we're saying things that maybe we don't even mean. We're doing things that maybe don't even feel right just because we want to know that we can be liked and that there is someone out there that will like us. And then when you take a step back and it's actually time to decide, do I like this person? It's like, oh, no, I actually don't. I haven't even thought about that for a second. <laughs> You know, yeah. when you were talking, I, I felt like a sense of sadness in my heart. And I really because it's like everyone's inner child just wants to be embraced and loved and held. Like, really, if we boil it all down, everyone in dating just wants to be seen and lovable. And the fact that we're in a position now where everyone is desperate for that inner child to be held makes me really sad, actually. I just got goosebumps everywhere. Yeah. I mean, think about people are going to great lengths to be liked, to be desired, to be craved, to be wanted. Why are we in such a position where our inner children are thirsty? That means there's an inherent problem in the system. I think a huge part of it is social media. Because before we were only exposed to the couples that we could see and that, you know, we're actually in front of us or maybe we're on TV in movies on a red carpet. But now you open Instagram, you open TikTok and it makes it seem like everyone is in a relationship and everyone else can be loved. And so even if that is literally not the case, because it's not, first of all, half these people posting like kissing pictures and stuff are not happy. You know, so that's that's one part of it is half of this is fake. The other part of it is maybe all of your friends are actually also single, but the few the, the people that you follow on social media from college who were like not even in your close friend group, but just were your acquaintances, they're all in relationships. So it makes you feel like, oh, everyone else is except for me. It always amplifies that feeling of other people have this thing that I don't. And because it's so personal, it's like love then you really get in your head and it's like, well, what's wrong with me that nobody loves me? And it's the saddest thing in the world. And it's so horrible that so many of us, like I spent years questioning that and truly believing that I was incapable of being loved. And I was sitting there being like, but I have so much love to give. And I just want to find this person that I can give all of this love to. And it was such a painful experience. And there are just so many people that feel that way. And it really is so tragic. Wow. It's so beautiful. Like it's sad, but it's also so beautiful because you're engaged. And, and I feel probably I'm making, you know, an assumption here, but I just feel that probably Jake is wholehearted. Right. And like, if you're, you're a wholehearted person and Paulina is one of the most wholehearted people I know. And Aaron, her partner is one of the most wholehearted guys I've ever met. And the guy, Alan, who I'm with now, who I want to be with forever, is one of the most wholehearted people I've ever met. And it's like, you can actually, you can actually experience that. And there's so much hope. I felt when, when you said, Alana, like, you know, I thought for so long that I wasn't lovable. I, I mean, people can see on the video, I had tears in my eyes because that's the same experience that I had. Like, what is it about me that's so flawed? Right. And it really, you know, now, you know, now in this phenomenal partnership that is very close to an engagement, ah! I think, I hope. Wait, today? No, oh, no. 
No, don't you think I would have texted you if I got engaged today? I know, but you have a ring on your finger. So I was like, is that a placeholder? What are we doing? No, this is this is just an Argentinian peso. Oh, just an Argentinian peso. <laughs> just one, not 1400, just one. Yeah, just one peso. Um, you know, when I think about Aaron and like what allowed me to feel so loved is that the energetic field, how much energy I put into it, how much energy he put into it was matched. There wasn't an incongruence in the field. And I've thought a lot about this in modern dating that the problem is, is that one person leans in too hard and creates an imbalance in this magnetic force. So then the other person has to lean out. And it's this terrible, grueling dance. And so I guess another thing that comes to mind is like really assess how much energy is the other person putting in. And then that determines how much energy you put in. And I don't mean it in a game playing way because I am against game playing, but more of just like really assessing the magnetic field of like, is it balanced or is it in a place where one of us is giving way too much? And I think that's completely reasonable and a very realistic way to approach it because you have to kind of zoom out if you're, you know, dealing with this right now and you're trying to figure out, oh, like if I text them this thing, is it too much or is it too aggressive if I asked them out because I asked them out again? First of all, like, no, that's a human thing and that's totally fine and normal. But if you're in the situation where you feel like every single time you've made the move and they haven't reciprocated that at all. And yeah, they'll show up to the date, but they're not really texting you in between. And they're making you question all this stuff, like zoom out and ask yourself, like, why would you move mountains for someone who isn't even giving you like the baseline effort or reassurance that you, if you were thinking about it, like if this was my best friend coming to me for advice and this was their situation, what would I tell them? I think that's a really good way to kind of analyze your situation, but through the lens of if this was someone else's situation. Okay. Tangible tools. They're all throughout here. I know, but I want to highlight like we're starting the section of tangible tools. I love a tangible tool. We love a tangible tool. The first tangible tool is, am I moving mountains and is it reciprocated? Yes. Hit it. Number two. Second tangible tool. Put yourself, take yourself out of the situation and kind of recite it to yourself as if it was your friend asking you for advice. What would you tell them to do in this situation? It's usually, usually it's never like if I have to go to my friend, it's usually like, get out, you know? Yeah. I haven't gone to Paulina and been like, oh my God, Alan loves you so much. (laughs) You know, she's like, it's all good. Alan's so different because he's, he's wholehearted and he's honest and he's vulnerable and he's a good fucking dude. But the other times you called me, I was like, (laughs) yikes. Yikes. But it's not it's not it's not always about saying get the fuck out. It's also about just having someone assess like, does this person meet your values? Does this person create safety in your nervous system? Does this person lean in and allow the stability that that you need in the dynamic? If those answers are yes, then you got to figure out how to navigate the conflict you're in. But sometimes the answer is no, they're not doing that for you. I get a lot of questions that sound like this. Me and this guy have been on six dates and all of the dates are great. But then in between, I don't hear from him for like 24 to 48 hours or we don't text at all except to set up the date. And I'm really anxious because when we're together, everything's great. But I overthink and spiral when we're not because I'm not hearing from him. What should I do? And here's what I'll say is if the, if what is happening in person is great. And when you are with this person, you are not anxious and you feel secure and you feel confident and you feel like this is great, then have a freaking conversation about it because this person might just not be a big texter, you know, but if they're texting you to make plans and they're not canceling on you and coming up with excuses and they're making the time to see you in person, like you have to focus on what happens when you and this person are together in real life. Everything else is kind of irrelevant at that point. It just gets so tricky because we're so caught up in having these relationships over text that when it's not there, we feel this void. We think something's wrong. We think, oh, well, like they're not thinking about me during the day. And, you know, maybe, maybe they're like, 
in, in the OR. Like maybe they're literally a surgeon and they can't text all day or they're in law school. God no, like, or they're, <laughs> no, they're not, they're not on the, or, uh, they're not being operated on. But like maybe they're in law school and they have a big exam coming up. Like there are all these things. And at the same time, you have to watch out for making excuses for someone else. Cause I think once you get in the habit of doing that, it's like a get the fuck out situation. But yeah, I think if everything is going really well in person and it's just what's happening between the dates, that's making you anxious, have a conversation with them because they might not even know that this is how you're feeling because of it. Well, and then the next thing people will say, because I get the same thing is, well, I don't know how to communicate it with them. Like, how do I even bring it up? So here's how you bring it up is when I'm with you, I feel so connected and it feels so awesome. And I would love to connect outside as well through texting and when we're not together. Yeah, it's so easy. You're not asking for that much. And, and here's the thing. This gives them an opportunity to show up for you in the way you need. And if they can't do that, then they're not the person for you. And if they can, great. That's like more reassurance that this is a great situation. Tangible tool number three is communicate. Wow. Woo! Holy shit. That's crazy. Crazy concept. It is. It's one of the most hardest concepts for people to, to learn and embrace and implement. But yeah, I mean, it's it's so simple to be able to say to someone like, I'm really feeling this and I and I look forward to deeper connection. Let's chat more in between. I was in the situation and I, I said to the person, I was like, I think we've been on four dates at this point. And I was like, I don't want to make a big deal out of this, but I feel like when I see you, everything is so great. And then in between our dates, I don't really hear from you. And it makes me anxious and second guess our connection. And I'm just curious, like, are you not that interested or are you just like not that big of a texter? Because I would really just love to know so I can kind of figure out what's going on here. And he was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I had no idea you were feeling that way. I'm a horrible texter. But if it means something to you, then, yeah, I can text you more. And this guy became the world's best texter overnight. (laughs) Wait, I know we're close to wrapping up, but I have two questions because we didn't even cover sex, which is a bummer. But like, I know that I know that people that are like listening are like, but like, when do I fuck? Like, when's okay to have sex? And then the second one is we've asked every single guest that we've had, except I think one. But (laughs) okay, Alana, what's your favorite sex position? I don't know. I'm. (laughs) Oh, she flustered. No, I'm weirdly I, I I'm weirdly very awkward about like talking about sex. Like I don't talk about sex on the podcast. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, good to know. Good to know. But I can I can still answer. I can answer. I'm like very vanilla, just like missionary. Oh, missionary's so hot. It's so it's such a great. It's it's classic. It works every time. Works every time. Why why mess with what works? What's your favorite sex position, Victoria? I'm saucy for sure. I'm saucy for sure. Doggy's great. Doggy's a classic too. I think I'm like, I'm definitely like, I'm a classic bitch, you know, like I like a missionary. I like a cowgirl. I like a, I'm not, I don't want to be in a spider. Like I don't want my legs, you know, like I don't want all of that. That shit is is a lot. Yeah, no. Or pulled ligaments, you know? Yeah. I don't want to pull something, but, um, I guess next time we have you on, we could talk about sex because it's like, so I think it's such a big part of this. It is, (laughs) is. but you don't talk about on your podcast. You know, I just it's it's never been something that I've felt like super comfortable talking even with my friends about. I don't know. It's always just felt like, okay, that's like a personal thing for me and whoever it is that I'm having sex with. Um, But I think the other part of it is and I kind of decided this early on in my career when I started being this like public facing person, I saw all of these other women around my age being very open and very vulgar about sex and very specific about like the people they were going on dates with and the sex they were having with them. And that really worked for them. Like they were, their careers were just like going, going up. And I was like, wow, should I be doing that? Cause that'll help me get to where I want to be in my career just faster and it'll be easier. And I, it was this really big question for me of of my values. And I kind of drew a very, strict line in the sand was like, that's not me. And I don't want to compromise like my values and what I feel comfortable with to excel in my career faster. And I also never wanted somebody to not want to date me because of what I did for a living. So that's kind of why I decided to stay PG 13. 
Mad respect. Mad respect. Victoria, thanks for crossing her boundaries. How would I know? That's okay. No, but I need to, I need to like, exper- I need to experiment every now and then and just like wiggle. And, and that's, that's not like too personal or invasive. Like Jake's not going to walk in and be like, give me that ring back. Like how could she? <laughs> Paulina just loves a moment where she can say, you know, you fucked up kid. It's good. She loves that. No, I really, I, I don't like saying that you fucked up. I like when you cross boundaries. <laughs> it turns me on a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, Alana, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for coming on to Shit Talking Shrinks and telling us about all of the dating know abouts. I don't know what to say in this moment. Roundabout moments, knowsings about. <laughs> and we're really grateful for you. We truly, truly are. Thank you both so much for having me. This has been so fun and many more conversations to be had. Amen. Yes. Big, big love, everybody. Big, big love. <laughs>